Hi, everyone, and good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar. Next slide, please. Again, we want to extend a warm welcome to all attendees this afternoon. This is the New Jersey Comprehensive School Mental Health Webinar Series. This is session five on risk assessment. This webinar is sponsored by the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center in collaboration with New Jersey Department of Education. The Northeast and Caribbean MHTTC is housed at Rutgers in the School of Health Professions in the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions. My name is Kathy Rivera and I'm the project coordinator of this center. I'll be introducing our center and our webinar presenters for today. Next slide, please. On your screen, you'll see the dates of our upcoming sessions in this series. Our next webinar session will be held on Thursday, March 24th from 3 p.m. to 4.15 Eastern Standard Time. And um, we will send a link to that, uh, to that registration page if you haven't registered already. Next slide, please. We also offer individual coach coaching sessions to provide a more targeted support to New Jersey district level teams. During this one hour session, uh, our team will assist you in developing your comprehensive school mental health framework and also provide an action plan to guide your next steps. These sessions will be available to all schools and districts on a first come and first serve basis um, by reservation only. All time slots are currently full until the end of the school year, but we are adding names to the wait list. The ones that we have available are the ones that you see on your your screen for this Friday, February 25th, from 1 to 2 p.m. and 2 to 3 p.m. I will share the registration link if you're interested in the chat box at the end of this webinar. Next slide, please. The MHTTC is funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to enhance the capacity of the behavioral health and other related workforces to deliver evidence-based and empirically supported practices to individuals with mental illnesses. Please visit the MHTTC Network website for additional information at mhttcnetwork.org. Our center also receives supplemental funding to support school teachers and staff to address student mental health, as well as support healthcare providers and wellness and self-care activities. Next slide, please. And if you're interested in staying up to date with the events and products the Northeast and Caribbean MHTTC is providing, we ask that you please sign up to receive our email communications. You can sign up at the bit.ly link provided in the screen and it will also be shared in the chat box. Next slide, please. Following the webinar, you'll be asked to complete a brief survey. We value this feedback and then use it to improve our activities and inform our future activities. These surveys are also important because our continued funding is linked to the, the completion of them. So we thank you in advance for your cooperation. Next slide, please. We also wanna let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website along with the PowerPoint presentation within seven days. Next slide, please. This presentation was prepared for the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. All material appearing in this presentation, except that taken directly from copyrighted sources, is in the public domain and may be reproduced or copied without permission from SAMHSA or the authors. Citation of the source is appreciated. Please do not reproduce or distribute this presentation for a fee without specific written authorization from the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. At the time of this presentation, Marianne Delphin Rittman served as Acting Assistant Secretary for the Mental Health and Substance Use at SAMHSA. The opinions expressed herein are the views of the speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. No official support or endorsement of DHHS or SAMHSA for the opinions described in this presentation is intended or should be inferred. Slide, please. We encourage you to interact with our presenters during our webinar by using the chat feature. Please post any comments or questions you have in the chat and I will collect your questions as we go and ask them of the presenter during the Q&A time towards the end of the presentation. 
During the webinar, our presenter may pose questions to you. So we please um, ask you to use the chat feature to answer those questions. Next slide. Now let's begin our webinar. We have Dr. Lauren DePinto and Mr. Basil Pizzuto with us today. Dr. DePinto is the district coordinator of school-based mental health services for the Ridgewood Public Schools in Ridgewood, New Jersey. She was honored to be selected as a member of the review committee and a contributing author of chapter six, Frameworks for Risk Response and Assessment in the recently published New Jersey Comprehensive School-Based Mental Health Guide. Dr. DePinto earned her doctorate in social work from the University of Pennsylvania School for Pub Social Policy and Practice, a Master of Science in Social Work from Columbia University, and a Bachelor of Science in Social Work and Sociology from Seton Hall University. Prior to her tenure in public education, Dr. DePinto started her career in community-based mental health and psychiatric emergency screening. She joined the Ridgewood Public Schools in 2005 as a school social worker on the child study team before moving into her clinical social work role as crisis intervention counselor, and most recently as the first appointed district coordinator of school-based mental health services for the Ridgewood Public Schools in 2019. Dr. DePinto also maintains a private psychotherapy practice in Northern Bergen County that has been established since 2013. She brings more than 15 years of practice knowledge and experience in school-based mental health, school social work, crisis intervention, and clinical practice with children and adolescents. Her general research interests include school-based mental health practice, attachment theory, relational trauma in schools, reflective supervision, staff wellness, and social work education. Mr. Basil Pizzuto is the Assistant Principal for Administration and Student Services at Ridgewood High School in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Mr. Pizzuto has a mathematics degree from Montclair State University, a master's in educational technology from Ramapo College, and a master's in educational leadership from the College of St. Elizabeth. He began his career as a high school mathematics teacher and became a great advisor at Ridgewood High School in 2002. After becoming assistant principal in 2007, Mr. Pizzuto focused his attention on organizing and leading a student-centered school-based mental health team that was based on relationship-based practices and relational alternatives to discipline. He brings decades of experience as an administrator, educator, student advocate, mentor, and beloved school staff member. As an administrator, Mr. Pizzuto continues to play an instrumental role in establishing a multi-tiered system of behavioral supports at RHS that has expanded across the district. He and Dr. DePinto had the initial honor of co-presenting the RHS school-based mental health model entitled, Creating a House that Smiles, Optimizing School Culture and Climate Through Relationship-Based Practices at the 2019 Annual Conference on Advancing School Mental Health in Austin, Texas, and again at the virtual 25th Annual School Mental Health Conference in October of 2020. We want to welcome you again, and I will turn it now to our presenters. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Thank you very much. I think it's a good time to, to get started. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, we're here today to talk about risk, to talk about risk assessment and to understand a general framework for how we assess risk, how we engage students and families and how we put policies in place to, to guide our practice. So what is risk and why should we assess it? Risk is um, an it, it all encompassing term. I think in education, as well as in mental health, it um, is very broad. And so for the purposes of today, risk means responding to a student or a group of students in distress during an emergency um, because there's an immediate crisis or there's a personal safety situation or issue at hand or when the student's demonstrating or being observed exhibiting concerning behavior. Um, and so there's a spectrum um, to understand. 
risk. But I think that it's very important to know that for the purposes of risk assessment and response, um, students are placed at risk because there are a number of factors in their lives um, that pose as barriers to learning and also just impact their overall mental health and well-being. A multi-tier system of support is the framework that is going to guide any solid and effective and efficient uh, response program. Um, and here is an out, you know, an overview of the intensive targeted and universal sort of supports, key strategies and partnerships. I think, you know, MTSS has been a huge part of the success in our own district and has helped us really communicate across tiers. So we really don't miss students as much as we can. We're, we're talking at different levels, we're talking to each other um, and it's fluid. And that's a really important aspect of, of risk assessment and response. At tier three, that's obviously the most intensive um, supports. That's the school clearance. That is the crisis intervention. Um, that's also special education and related services, intensive family supports. Tier two is really about short-term targeted interventions. Um, but I think in terms of risk assessment, because that's what we're talking about, that really is a part of every tier. And if we work very hard as districts, as teams, whether it's site-based or building-based, district-based, you know, it's about tier one and tier two being strong enough to then sort of reduce risk for um, intensive supports that are needed. Nevertheless, it's important that all three exist. One of the other pieces here that I do want you to pay attention to, you know, or that is important to me, is that schools, you know, really need to partner at every level. Every single level, they need to partner with students and families. They are present and they are key stakeholders in the success of any program. And I think that it's very important that they, they know that and that's demonstrated, but that any establishment of protocol or policy, which we'll get into, really includes their voice and includes an accurate assessment of their needs. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, moving forward. In terms of best practices, that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, I, I think one of the most important things uh, for me as a practitioner, but as a school-based mental health provider, whether that's a school counselor, school social worker, school psychologist, school administrator, nursing professional, psychiatric staff, is that risk assessment is relational. You cannot have a thorough assessment or you can't thoroughly engage, um, assess and intervene without a relationship. And I think that we're in a human services profession, schools are you know, the de facto mental health system, which we all know, and any intervention is about relationships. They are interchangeable. And that is really where we have to kind of look at the theoretical approach to how we actually practice from an evidence-based perspective. Some basic best practices here, like I had mentioned before, screening should be a part of a comprehensive MTSS program. Um, if that doesn't exist, that's where you start. Do we have this program? Is it clear? Do we have a framework? Risk versus protective factors. We can't have a conversation about risk without truly being able to operationalize what risk factors are, what protective factors are, and how we can look for them at the student level, the individual level, the family level, and the community level, because we that's going to help the framework of how we accurately intervene and most sensitively intervene. Um, I think in terms of you know, definitions, it, it's important to remember that the, the protective factor is defined um, by SAMHSA you know, as a characteristic at the biological, psychological, family, or community, including peers and culture level that's associated with a lower likelihood of problem outcomes, or that reduces the negative impact of a risk factor on problem outcomes. That's important to note because conversely, um, a risk factor can be defined as a characteristic at the biological, psychological, family, community, or cultural level that precedes and is associated with a higher likelihood of problem outcomes. So you can't have one without the other, essentially. But we have to know what we're looking for if we're going to address them. We, we need protective factors to buffer against risk, but we need risk to bolster 
what protective factors are designed to do as human beings in growth and development. Families and students should be involved in planning and implementing screening at every level. Like I said, they are key stakeholders in whether what we decide to do actually works. We need their voice and we need their input. And we also need to understand depending on district, depending on demographics, depending on the, the specific culture and climate of our buildings um, and our districts, they need to be involved. School-based based mental health screening practices should always prioritize accuracy. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Privacy, confidentiality, um, safety, and follow through. Follow through is incredibly important um, because it's a you know very sensitive process. And follow through, it's a demonstration, right? That that child matters. So some basic steps um, in establishing a screening process. Before um, I start with the steps, I think it is important to acknowledge that you need to know what you're screening for. Screening is also a very broad term. And so when things are broad, it's important that as practitioners, as team members, as school administrators, we start to distill what it is that we're looking to screen for, right? Getting specific. And if they're screening for you know, general at risk um, issues, whether that's you know, grades, attendance, truancy, that's one piece. If we're actually screening for depression, that's a whole other set, right, of measures. And so it's important, like I said, to find what you're screening for, and it could be at different levels and for different things. We can do you know, universal screeners at tier one. We can do more targeted screening uh, at tier two, or we can do much more intensive screening at tier three. So before we can do anything, though, we need a foundation needed team. A multidisciplinary team is where to start. That includes school psychologists, right? School-based mental health providers, school social workers, the nursing staff, administration, um, you know, any key stakeholders, special education teachers. I mean, we're all in this together. And the more voices you have with different specializations, the more accuracy is going to be involved in putting together a framework for your buildings. Clarifying goals, identify the purposes and intended outcomes. What are you looking to screen for? What's the outcome we're looking for and how do we get there? Identify resources and logistics. Timelines, identify staffing and budget resources, develop administrative policies. It's important to kind of look at like what's within our ability, right? What do we have access to? Um, is it feasible, right? We wanna make sure that all of these things are at least a part of a checklist that you would use. Selecting an appropriate screening tool. This could be informal or it can be formal, but it's about having a unified approach um, to selecting this tool and being able to kind of start the process, have everyone put into that process, understand how the process works, what their roles are, right? Defining what their actual job tasks are as a part of this team and, and then moving forward to step two. As in, in any um, formal, certainly, but even informal screening process, we need to determine consent and assent processes. That means that parents, again, comes back, I think every slide, you know, I'll come back to this, uh, parents need to be involved, families need to be involved, students need to be involved in terms of consenting to participation. And I think the last step, obviously, is develop data, collection, what are we doing, how are we doing it, um, and follow-up processes. Now that we did this, what's next, right? Screening is measures in, in this protocol is really only as good as like what our long-term plan is, right? What's year two or three? And then what's next and how do we build on that? Understanding risk assessment and crisis intervention. Um, there are two really big thing, key takeaways, right? Um, obviously, we can have a whole other webinar on both of these uh, things, uh, just to talk about the in-depth nature of all of the work. But it's important to know as school professionals that not all risk assessments um, or students identified in acute crisis require a referral to the local emergency room or a psychiatric facility, right? We still need to, within school-based mental health especially, look at the least restrictive environment, right? From a strengths-based perspective, what's the least restrictive environment to meet the needs of said student and family? Um, and I think that that's a good sort of basis to determining the communication protocol. Frameworks for response include communication protocols. This will be dependent on your buildings. This will be dependent um, on resources available. But it is important 
that communication protocols exist. This includes who, what, and when, right? Who needs to know? Who in the chain of command is required to know the sensitive information? Let's not forget that confidenti confidentiality matters most here, right? Who's required to know? What does the Board of Education policies in your district dictate, right? What information do they need to know? And in what form do they need to know specific details? What's outlined in board policy? And then when, at what point in the process is the information shared? And so more specifically in schools, this means something is presented, we need to think on our feet, right? About what's required to tell someone, usually an administrator, and what do they need to know? And at what point in, in the evaluation, at what point in the process, do we tell them this information? And these are things that really, again, need to be developed as a team. Teaming and collaboration are you know, paramount to success in any school-based mental health endeavor. Certainly, as you're developing a strengths-based relational model for risk assessment and response. So, Triage and levels of risk. I think that this is a very important and critical part of this presentation. And again, this is more of an overview because I think there's a lot to talk about in terms of how you go from low risk, moderate risk and high risk. It's important to know that having a severity index is critical. And by that, I mean a spectrum. How do we understand what's presented, what the presenting problems are, right? How do, how do we understand how the student's demonstrating distress. Low risk, not urgent, tier one intervention, responsive light support, right? Moderate to urgent, tier two. You know, that's very targeted support. It's very specific and it's acute. Um, the student's demonstrating or is reporting, you know, high levels of mood or behavioral difficulties or distress. Al al alternative teachers could be bringing said student to you as well. Right. I think in schools, we move at such a fast pace that there are a lot of pathways um, that students come come to us. And then I think it's important for us to understand what are we dealing with? And if you look at it in a way that categorizes it, it helps you kind of have a framework right, for what action is needed. High risk and imminent danger. That's very clear. That's crisis intervention. That is that said student is in distress and is in need of a school clearance or is in need of a visit to the emergency room, right? That's a very clear high risk, imminent danger, tier three intervention. Again, I kind of touched upon these and these are just some ideas. There are a number of things I think we all do every day that kind of fit into here, but these are just some examples uh, based on the severity index of, as to what you might do in response um, for a student and family. Provide community resources. If a student is coming to you um, and they need an outpatient referral, that's something we can offer. Responsive relational discipline practices. A, a large part of any school-based mental health program and risk response framework is really about looking at how we, our whole discipline chart, right? How do we, how do we discipline students? It has to be relational. And that's a huge piece of what we'll talk about in terms of the district exemplar because that's really been the, the framework for how we do things in, in Ridgewood. Uh, offer consultation to students, teachers, that's huge. And you can do that at every level. I think partnering with teachers because they're on the front lines and they have the most contact with students is the best vehicle we have for looking at a tier one sort of understanding of, of risk, but also it's an opportunity to educate people, um, teachers in mental health literacy. And that, again, it comes by being able to partner with them and having an established sense of trust. Low to moderate, level two, low to moderate interventions. Again, it kind of includes all of the tier one, but then there's a little bit more, right? And that's developing a resource plan. Um, you know, once a student's brought to your attention, there's an opportunity for an ongoing relationship. It's not sort of like a, a one-time experience. Now the follow-up happens, now the relationship happens, now the counseling can happen in a different way. And that can include an actual plan, um, identifying protective factors and pro-social supports in school. I think oftentimes kids need to be able to kind of visualize that. We need to be able to identify those things so they can rely on those when they're in need, but they can also look at 
you know, ways of coping through using, whether it be staff in the building that they trust or other protective factors that they identify as a way to cope. Um, tier two interventions that focus on skills, coping skills would be are a huge opportunity to provide response. So weekly meetings with students to monitor social and emotional health, but also their symptoms, right? We need to see them. We need to get a sense of where they are post um, issue that brought us together, right? Family support, outpatient referrals again. I think a large part of our work is partnering with families, but also partnering with mental health agencies, community mental health agencies, county agencies, private practitioners, and other collateral contacts to be able to have a network of mental health providers that we trust and that we can work with and we can refer to. I think it's very important, certainly for today. And again, this is just an overview um, in terms of looking at like the dimensions of, of student mental health and how to determine the severity index, the level of threat, but what we really need to look for, right? What we need to be mindful of as we're having these relational conversations with students and families. Let's mood, behaviors. Again, this is kind of a recap because I touched upon this. So I'll go through it a little quicker. Um, and if anyone has questions, you can let me know, or we can talk at the end. But these are things to kind of visualize in your own checklist about where to, where to look and where to pay attention to the verbal and nonverbal communication. Again, mood, behaviors, risk and protective factors, levels of stress and distress, substance use and misuse, social and cultural supports, family and home environment, history of bullying or harassment, suicidal thoughts, plans, or gestures, mental health history, access to resources. It's important that we have mental health history. So not for any other reason, except to really truly understand the context of what's going on. And that's really helpful as we decide, okay, maybe this is more severe. Maybe this is a tier two intervention. Maybe this is a crisis intervention. And getting this information is critical to an evaluation. General triage and student assistant protocols typically include, um, the research supports this, but this is also kind of in terms of my own practice, how we've generalized our approach. And that includes responding immediately, where you know, a large part of our school-based mental health program is the direct access to adults immediately and as needed. And that's going to be huge in terms of having a safe space or space or bank of offices that's confidential, that's child-friendly, that, that feels safe, that literally the proximity of the, of, the, of the office and how it's set up creates a sense of safety. We, keeping the, the student secure, right? That's paramount, obviously, depending on how we understand any sort of threat or concern, um, certainly at the beginning. Then getting into a conversation, assessing for the level of risk. These can, this can include a formal or informal measurement. An informal interview is the best first step, right? In kind of including all of the other elements I just talked about. And we can talk a little bit later I, in a future slide about maybe specific measures. And I know that in the New Jersey Comprehensive School-Based Mental Health Guide, there is a chapter devoted to suicide assessment. And there's a number of different vetted resources that we can use to more formally um, assess for risk. The next step is determine appropriate action. You know, this is really about what action is necessary. And we determine what action is necessary when we have a relationship with the student. We have a solid assessment of the biopsychosocial aspects of the student's situation. And we also understand context. Then that will help us also inform the appropriate follow-up action plan, which is necessary. Clarify student reentry guidelines. We'll talk a little bit more about that in another slide because reentry is very, very important about helping the student seamlessly transition back into learning. And documentation. And documentation really is any set of policies, protocols, or paperwork that we determine is the way to keep track of all of the actions taken um, and kind of what how we organize the work. Some basic steps, and again, this is best practice, this is a recommendation, um, would be, like I had said, to create a site or district um, mental health intervention team. At Ridgewood, 
one of our successes has been the creation of a mental health intervention committee, which started grade six through 12. And now we've, we have plans to kind of bring to the K-12 uh, school-based mental health support team. And the mental health intervention committee is really made up of multidisciplinary practitioners, administration, school social workers, school psychologists, nurses, special education teachers, regular education teachers. Um, so we have a shared interest in knowing what's going on at every tier of service, but we also have the information we need to understand what we do and when we do it. You know, it's, it's this team that can create the language that your school is going to use to create these protocols and policies. And that's an important part of, of this. The next, and I think I talked about this, but a visual aid is, is so important because it, we literally want a step-by-step -step action plan. You know, what do we call crisis or what do we call risk? Um, what do we do when this happens, that happens? Literally a chain of command where we can pick it up and we can look at it and we know exactly who to access. I think it's also important too, if we don't have access to that, sometimes because of the nature of working in schools, it's very hard to get caught up or distracted. And that's why policy and protocol really, even if it's a framework is so important and is a large part of what administrators, and I've been lucky enough to have my administrator be a part of our policy, but it's what administrators can really do to help guide their buildings and um, you know, kind of keep the work efficient and, and really the most effective. So just some quick notes on screening tools. Uh, the information collected, obviously, from any screening tool is valuable insight into a student's well-being. I think it's very important, though, that we consider whatever tool we're using. We do it with fidelity. We have training. And we also are, you know, we focus on confidentiality. And that's a huge piece because mental health, school-based mental health, um, and any interventions related to this um, is, is very important that we prioritize confidentiality and we are very clear about where we're actually keeping any records. If you refer to chapter six in the New Jersey Comprehensive School-Based Mental Health Guide, you will see an outline of the four of, of these tools. This, um, these tools are recommendations. Obviously there are a number of other ones, but I recommend that you take some time and go through chapter six so you can get a little bit more of the context to what I'm trying to get through in a very short period of time. And the brief intervention for school clinicians is a very good tool that can be helpful in implementing a framework for assessment and response. So re-entry and transition. This is a very important aspect of risk assessment. And I think sometimes we don't pay as much attention to it as, as we should. But I think if a child is um, experience any, experiencing excuse me, any sort of distress or is hospitalized for some reason, um, whether it be mental health or otherwise, quite honestly, in this case, mental health, it's important to understand what, you know, the dynamics of what that experience feels like and how it might impair their, their ability to learn and how it is incumbent upon us to, right, develop a plan that's going to help them seamlessly and comfortably come back to school. Because at the end of the day, school-based mental health is about removing barriers to learning and doing our best to support you know, a child's right to education. And it's very hard to get, get into the classroom and to meet the demands of, of school, of homework, of, of anything related to the task of learning if, you're dealing with an internalized or externalized, you know, set of circumstances. And it, a re-entry meeting can be an incredible opportunity to partner with parents, to show that you really wanna build a relationship with them, to show that you care and that together, you're gonna to make accommodations temporary or otherwise as needed to support their return to school. Typically, these are some recommended steps. Meet with the family and student. I think that's the first step, right? Is having an in-person meeting. As of right now, obviously I'm doing this during uh, COVID-19. Um, so there are some accommodations we'll have to make. And if it needs to be virtual, that might be the only option. But a meeting is first priority. Ensuring the appropriate releases, right? 
Um, we want to partner with collateral contacts or treatment providers who can give us insight into what it is that we need to do in school, right, to help ease transition back. But that is obviously only with permission of the parents, guardians, and student. It's very important as part of the reentry plan to designate a go-to in the building, whether that is a school counselor, guidance counselor, administrator, um, coach, school-based mental health provider, case manager. It's very important to have a go-to adult. That go-to adult obviously is there to provide support and understanding, but is also there to help communicate with teachers, to help communicate with the larger staff in terms of what the child's needs are as an advocate. It's also important to assess missed work, right? I think it's very important to consider prioritizing what work we need to do, what work we could waive based on what a child needs. And by doing that, we implement appropriate modifications. We inform the student and family of the supports and services in schools, which are voluntary. And you know, we adhere to the best we can, right? To the extent possible as a partnership to the recommendations from treatment providers. But more importantly, we start to train staff that are involved in the student's life. And I think that that's a huge piece in terms of advocacy is helping staff understand students within the confines of confidentiality um, and help them understand how they can approach the situation most sensitively. And monitoring. Monitoring is, is key, right? It's, this isn't just a one-time intervention. This could be a life, this could be a years long relationship. This could be, you know, the start of something very important for, for a child. Teaming, related to risk assessment. Teaming is one, of, like I said before, and I will say it again, uh, teaming has been responsible for the successes that I've had as a crisis intervention counselor um, for decades, but it also is the best way for us all to get on the same page. Um, you know, risk assessment is a relational endeavor. Risk assessment, really, we would like, to, I want to demystify it, right, if I can, because I think sometimes we get very caught up in the necessary aspects of the, the evidence, right? The paperwork, the policies, the protocols, which are very important. But what's more important is that we work together with one interest in mind, and that is what's best for a child. And, you know, constantly talking to each other, having team meetings, um, making sure that they're in our schedules, right? Uh, you know, I have a weekly GA team meeting for this reason. And we'll talk a little bit about what a GA is a little bit later, but Collaboration, coordination, and communication are critical to doing something for a child that really is person-centered, student-centered. But it's a way to get everyone on board to work the most efficiently. A note quickly on community engagement. Um, it's luckily, you know, we have a partnership with Care Plus New Jersey. Um, we have a tier three support uh, program, which has been instrumental in helping us really meet the tier three needs. Um, and I know there are uh, different districts across the state, um, but as a part of our connection to Care Plus, you know, Perform Care New Jersey has been a huge asset and resource. And the chapter six does outline a lot of these um, community services in greater detail, but, you know, look to, perform care, um, you know, mobile response and other screening services as outlined to be supportive in the process. Um, partnerships are critical to risk assessment and response, both in district employee school staff, as well as, you know, the um, services that we contract with, but they also have access to 24 hour care um, and consultation to help us create policy and programming. Again, family engagement is critical to any, any program um, associated with risk assessment and response. And risk assessment and response is really a part of the larger school-based mental health program. But families are essential um, to partner with, and they also are essential in the safety of our students, but it is also our job to really help families and communities when necessary and where necessary, where necessary, get linked up together so families who need support have access to support. As a, as a social worker, this is probably the most exciting part of the chapter that I wrote um, and such a necessary component of any training 
uh, regarding school-based mental health, but certainly regarding um, risk assessment. And some cultural considerations that I think are necessary, if not vital for us to have a part of our everyday practice would be engaging in self-evaluation, you know, to build cultural self-awareness. We, we need to understand ourselves before we accurately uh, understand others. It's, it is our jobs and our, our district's jobs to improve cultural and racial literacy and, and provide opportunities for that. You know, it is necessary in this work to apply culturally responsive micro skills and engage the student and their family, you know, to, to establish support or an access or circle of support that's really culturally relevant and meaningful to them. And in terms of crisis response, I've outlined, you know, a couple of different steps. Obviously, this is in much greater detail in chapter six. And I think that you would find additional resources that can be helpful. But, you know, culturally competent crisis response includes identifying specific culture related needs of the community. You need to understand that in order to meet those needs and, and meet students and families where they are, not where we want them to be. Maintain a current profile of the cultural composition, right? Identify formal and informal resources. Identify, the, certainly when it comes to crisis intervention and risk assessment, we do need to identify the meaning of suffering, pain, and death. And we need to anticipate and identify possible solutions that really speak to cultural and linguistic competency, which is a good segue into staff competencies, obviously. Um, and, you know, for this particular chapter and this assessment, you know, we all kind of come to the work with our own training and each discipline has, um, you know, its own specialization, you know, training associated. Um, but I think more than that, it's very important that staff really focuses on building a therapeutic alliance. So those competencies, I think, start with clinical competencies, counseling competencies, truly understanding how to use the therapeutic alliance to engage, assess, intervene, um, and also, you know, evaluate. Those are, those are critical. But at the, at the very end of the day, it's really about positive value, personal credibility, and uh, permission and protection to engage in exploration and change. And a large part of what we do at, at Ridgewood, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is really use theory, right? And adapt it for practice. And the PACE attitude for practice, which was originally a part of the develop, dyadic developmental psychotherapy, DDP, um, it, it, it's really about relational trauma and addressing relational trauma. But a large part of that theory, which I'm not going to get into, is about an attitude for practice. And the PACE attitude is really about engagement with, at every, in every aspect in schools, whether it be with staff, parents, families, or students. It's about being playful, right? Accepting, curious, and empathic. And I think that having that as a foundation for risk assessment is really, is really where we need to begin in terms of our response. So the following are just a couple of team reflection questions that you can think about now. Um, certainly consider bringing back to your teams, bringing back to your buildings, bringing back to those you consult with. And, you know, considering you're experiencing uh, processing triage, conducting risk assessments um, in your everyday work, what qualities or skills do you feel help you meet those needs? Because I think we often meet those needs and we have a lot of skills that if shared, it becomes a huge resource bank. Um, of collegial support. Um, but conversely, you know, where, what qualities or skills that we have to develop further to broaden our repertoire of responses? You know, what are whole school culture and climate factors in our buildings that affect student learning and impact students' place at risk? It's important to do a needs assessment and kind of really understand that just with, with curiosity, not even judgment, but just curiosity. What are we doing well and where are the openings for us to start to improve? And how do we understand or currently address the diverse social, cultural, and language needs of students being referred for assistance and risk assessment? That is a critical aspect of a whole student, whole school approach to risk assessment. So at this point, I will hand it over um, to my administrator, my mentor, and a very close friend who has partnered with me, obviously. Um, to discuss the Ridgewood Public School District um, as a New Jersey district exemplar. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I want to start by saying, well, I'll introduce myself. I'm Basil Pizzuto. And um, I'm going to start by saying that, you know, watching uh, Lauren go through, you know, her chapter, chapter six, that, you know, we as an exemplar, you know, are have a lot to be proud of, but we have a lot of work to do. So, you know, listening to Lauren speak, these are, we have areas to work on. So I think that we as a state will move together um, and do this together. Um, and just to kind of introduce myself, I'll start, well, first, you know, apologize for the way I'm dressed. Um, I'm actually um, on a school trip. Um, I'm chaperoning a trip overseas. This has been a trip that's been postponed since before COVID and really following through and making sure the trip that these kids were excited about happen is kind of like who I am, but then also being here for, you know, this mission that we believe in, uh, even on such a trip. Um, I just didn't have enough room in my luggage to pack a suit. So I'll start with that. And uh, I had this like interesting, before I go into talking about um, the school, uh, just an interesting thing that I was, like somebody observed me as, you know, I was talking to this, the teacher who's with me on this trip um, and, you know, talking about this presentation and she had, you know, paid attention to a conversation that we had over dinner with the students and we have 16 students and they're high school students and many of them are in their senior year. So uh, the students were kind of talking about senior pranks and they started uh, going kind of going after me about like different pranks they had ideas and, and, and reminiscing about senior pranks that had in the past. And, you know, and I, I, I shared with them information about the pranks and even some pictures that I had of some things, but then I kind of followed up with the other side, you know, some of the, some of the experiences that we had um, with some of the, you know, the, the, the bad stuff that happened. And, um, and, and the way I approached the students was to, to really meet them where they were at and not just shut down the conversation, but really listen to them and then give them something to think about. Um, and that conversation went on for the better of 15 minutes. And, and this teacher, a good friend of mine, Anjali, who's uh, with me, um, you know, pointed out that, that, that really listening to students and engaging with them in an authentic way is really at the heart of what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, so I leave all the technical stuff to Lauren and I'll talk about our um, team because that allows me to lean on people like Lauren uh, for those technical things. But to build a team that just cares about kids is really what we're talking about. So a little bit about the district. Um, it's made up of a number of schools. I work at the high school. I'm primarily a high school um, employee, but I have been working very closely uh, with the middle school principals and the elementary school principals uh, to create a K-12 comprehensive multi-tiered model for mental health. Um, so that's been really exciting and we have really grown. Um, I've been in my position since uh, 2007, but really I've been in it since 2002 and I'll talk a little bit more about that, basically doing the same thing. And, and I, I like to give the credit to the, the people that came before me and then also some key administrators that, that did hiring in such a way of not just looking for people that wanted to go into administration, but kid, people who were kid-centered student-centered to be in key roles was, was something the district was dedicated to. Um, so people like me didn't just move through the position to moving on in, in the career. My career grew over the years in the position I'm in. And so I thought that's a unique uh, thing. So um, we have two middle schools also, and then six elementary schools. Um, we're located in Bergen County. It's a, you know, upper middle class town. Uh, we have a population of 1,782 students, staff of 200. And we have a long tradition of demonstrating a progressive school culture, beginning with an open campus in the 1970s. And that was due to a building construction project where they had the students spread out throughout the town. So this idea of an openness uh, campus goes long before my time there. Um, and a unique student management structure set up in the 80s. I'm gonna use this word grade advisor. Uh, and numerous student freedoms based on mutual respect and trust. And our number one belief in Ridgewood is that self-regulation and self-direction is the best form of student management and one we foster and believe in. So we trust our students. We you know, encourage our students to take care of themselves, but we're there to support them through that. Um, so a little bit about how we grew our mental health program is during the 2000s, 
the great advisor team, which existed since the 1980s. And I'll just explain what a great advisor is. It's a key person in a class's life at the high school. So when they come in as a freshman, that goes through to senior year. You take your class through the senior year. So I, in my position as an assistant principal, remain as a great advisor and I have a class. So I'm now the sophomore GA and then I will stay with them to graduation. So from the day they walk into school to the day they walk off the field and into project graduation, which I stay with till the next day, I am with them through it all, the thick and thin. So that includes discipline, attendance, class activities, we don't split this into, well, one teacher is in charge of class activities and they run the prom and one person's in charge of discipline and another person's in charge of attendance. It's all one person with a team around us to support that person. Um, and then we have a team of four people that really work closely together. And we also share students because the students' lives are intertwined. So it's a very unique um, position. And it's one where you really get to know the students um, you know, through all of their ups and downs, their joys and their sorrows. And I think that that's the number one thing in terms of risk assessment is really knowing your students. This has been copied into the middle school where um, middle school guidance counselors or school counselors follow a loop like that where they follow a class through in one of our middle schools. Um, and so it's really been a, a unique thing. And it's really about a student-centered student -centered, uh, relational approach when addressing discipline and attendance, um, we really move toward. Uh, so everything we do in terms of discipline is about the relationship. We do um, still have traditional things like detentions and we have school suspensions and out-of-school suspensions, but we always start with, this is an opportunity to get the student, uh, to know the student better. Uh, we rarely use out-of-school suspensions. If we do, we partner uh, with Bergen County in a suspension alternative program, which links the student to further services. Um, and it's been a fantastic thing uh, for, for, for those students that need to be out of school. In 2006, um, this, I want to just go back, Lauren, for one thing. Sure. sure. That we, we the, the, the part where we like, coupled um, with, uh, and, and you'll probably have to speed me along because I could talk about this stuff yeah. forever, but I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, going. we, I didn't rush you, don't rush <laughs> me. Um, you used all of my time. That's what this is really about. So I, we, we partnered um, with a psychologist, a local psychologist who really brought the psychological lens to a lot of stuff we're doing. And then we thought it was really important to have um, psychologically and social work minded people on our team. Uh, so we hired um, an LCSW followed by a second year, another LCSW worked in the middle of high school. And the <laughs> model with these people is that we are in an authentic relationship. So I do not refer students to Lauren, uh, to Dr. DePinto now. I refer students to our team. We, we're a part of a team. So we meet every four days and we talk as a team, all the great advisors, all of the mental health support people. And we talk about kids and we talk to each other. We're a team. And that relationship is so important. It's not just about um, the relationships with the students or relationships with the community. It's about the relationships with your team first, because that's how you build the, the support network. Seven, you know, several years later, we moved on to uh, bringing in uh, tier level three services, and now we contract with Care Plus that provide that, but also the Care Plus provider is an equal part of our team and has a voice on our team in terms of helping students. And if I can just add quickly, because I do think it's relevant to this in terms of training is not, not only, um, you know, uh, the tier three provider, a part of our team, but in addition, the clinical staff, um, LCSWs and other clinical providers have weekly supervision as well. So we carve out time to really get, um, you know, clinical about our work and, and kind of really assess our work. So it's like, it's meetings, it's relationships, but everyone is a part of the team. Um, and that's, I think that's huge. And, and we don't just talk about student problems. Like if, when we're talking about things like the upcoming prom or the, the, you know, the incident that happened out last week that has a disciplinary action associated with it. The, the, the mental health professionals in the room have a voice. It's not just, well, we're gonna refer a kid to you. They have a voice in the whole thing. 
So the addition of clinical staff members helped shift the district's understanding of student surface behavior and helped set the tone for how we understand and respond to student risk. This mental health focus across multiple domains has evolved and expanded over nearly two decades. And this is really about mental health. I, I liked in, you know, in Lauren's chapter, the talking about, we're not always talking about mental illness, we're talking about mental health or the lack of mental health in some cases. Right. So in terms of risk assessment, I just want to like overemphasize, obviously Lauren talked a lot about what to do when kids are identified at risk and then getting those you know, connected to services, but you cannot identify kids at risk if you don't know what's going on in their lives. So the, the relationships our staff has with students, uh, professional relationships, but real authentic relationships where you really know the students and foster that um, is, is really important so that you know when a kid is at risk. Um, and we have some other things in addition to just like, you know, the relationship the piece, which we'll get to. But we want to increase positive connections between adults and students at all levels of learning. And, uh, you know, this says Ridgewood High School, but all through the continuum from elementary school uh, through. Um, obviously, I think that, you know, what we've done at the high school is kind of do approach more of how we approach kids like we do in the elementary schools with the classroom teacher that really sees the whole child. Um, and then we built in supports at the elementary level with having a guidance counselor on staff, with having access uh, to people like Lauren who are professionals in their field uh, to support them. We just have so to there are a number of, yes? Yeah, let's just, because I want to get to the, to the end of it, but um, just want to are you okay if I move that forward? Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I'll jump in. Uh, so things like, you know, meetings are important. The structure is very important. Time for people to have access to adults. So we have this thing called period nine after school teachers in our classrooms are waiting to meet with students. And it's split between students needing help in their subject area or students, students need, needing support. Um, we, we had a, a situation where we had administrators call students to really talk to them and find out what they're doing. And that student, um, that relationship found out that certain kids were going to teachers in their period nines for the support over their time at Ridgewood High School. So in addition to, you know, the, the relational piece is to use technology and, and, and many of the districts I'm sure are using these type of tools, but online safety software systems. So we do not, we have not used straight out screening tools yet. And that's an area we're looking into to screen students for mental health, but we are very um, active at using things like our gaggle system, light speed systems, Go Guardian. These are various software products that look at how students are using the online platforms that we have, identifying students, and then that makes us connect to those students and then have those conversations uh, that Lauren was talking about. So we do have challenges, you know, when you, you go to a, a kind of a system like this is getting staff buy-in and getting staff on board. And that took time. It takes a lot of conversations, again, through relationships. It also go, go, gets done through uh, professional development. Um, shared understanding of student risk, that we, we do talk to each other about how, how we identify that this student is at risk. And we have a shared belief in that. Um, something called system cultivation, symptom cultivation is something that you know, was brought up in the years past uh, with, with the psychologist who's working with us, and that is many schools cancel events if it has any negative student behavior, and we want to keep having our students have memories, make memories, um, you know, I'm in a foreign country now with students, then yes, there is always a risk that a student might uh, behave poorly on a trip like this, but those students are are doing these things outside of the school anyway. And having a, a, a place where we can hold the student and get them help that they need is a really great thing. So that's an area to look at. Um, service overlap is always, it's a good thing, but it's also a challenge because in our school, students don't always know like who the school counselor is versus their grade advisor versus the administrator who's very you know involved with them. And sometimes they don't know those things. And that service overlap does sometimes need some teasing out that, you know, this person's going to do this for you and that person's going to do that. And then the more you dig into students' lives, uh, you're going to get a compassion fatigue. You're going to find out more and then you're going to own that. And that's the part of being a team and, and having the supports uh, of each other to get through those hard times. So we have many successes. Um, 
a lot of increased interdepartmental communication and that our, our you know, mental health staff across the district has really been moving forward and meeting monthly. Um, opus, open access to adults in the building. Like we said earlier, we have open campus at the high school. Students are free to come to adults, walk in their offices, hang out, talk to them, and that open access is very important. Uh, streamline access to direct mental health intervention for students, staff, and families. So we do offer our, you know, through our website and through also meetings that we have offer a lot of um, connections that our students know what supports there are. Um, we had a shown decrease in student uh, clearances and hospitalizations and uh, disciplinary actions over the years. And then, of course, the creation of our position of school-based mental health uh, coordinator to help coordinate all this. Because I do believe that, you know, my background is in math and I do this out as a labor of love, but it's good to have key people in positions that know the protocols, know what we should be doing and always consulting as a constant with those people so we know what we're doing is best for kids. So a few lessons we learned, everything we do is about the relationship with the student, what's doing best um, for the student. Um, adopting attitudes, it's playful. Lauren talked about the PACE model, being playful, accepting, curious, and empathetic. Um, we make decisions that's best for students and not always for the staff. And that, that, that's some of the challenges because staff likes us to do things that, that they want us to do. We always have to say what's best for students. And team members, regardless of discipline or training, believe our interactions can be healing as much as a protective factor in the lives of students. And that's always a tough one. Uh, Dr. DePinto talks a lot about rupture and repair. It's those students that you have a rupture with that you need to repair that relationship and show them that you're still a strong factor in their life and that, you know, that you're not just putting them away because they did that and you know, throw them away. It's really important that you're still there for them. Absolutely. And I think just to add, I think one of the benefits is that we look at risk as an opportunity, right? We look at behaviors as communication. And it's been, I think, key in getting us to work together to, to, to listen to what yeah, we believe that everything a student does, everything they do, they're telling their story and they're looking for you to listen to it. And right. so having the student talk more, it's, it allows them to tell you more instead of doing these things that are these negative things around you to get that attention. Okay. So here are a number of resources. Again, I selected those that I think are most appropriate to today's discussion, but there are many more in the actual chapter. And there are a number of different um, pieces of information, data points, uh, research articles, as well as like really great tools. Um, the School Mental Health Referral Pathways Toolkit, if you haven't downloaded it, if you haven't read it, that is the one thing I recommend you definitely do. It is incredible um, and it's current. And so, you know, take a look at some of these resources that are available because there are a number um, of resources at our fingertips. And I think it's time for, for questions and answers, so. Yes, I wanna thank you so much, uh, Dr. DePinto and uh, Assistant Principal um, Pizzuto just for such an inspiring and informative presentation. Uh, we have a few questions, and I also want to encourage anyone who has some questions just to type them in the Q&A box. Um, and I'm going to start with one around an assessment tool for assessing um, potential homicidal risk. Um, would you have any suggestions for that? Specifically for homicidal risk? Yes. So more recently, if, um, the, I, I don't have the screening tool right in front of me, but there, there are um, newer tools that we are using. And I believe the Department of Justice um, disseminated uh, current literature that outlines certain points and specific questions regarding homicidal threat for school providers, an inventory and actual interview list. Um, and we, Basil, did you want to speak up? We, we went through uh, that I as just, a team. I mean, the thing, I, just the thing that goes to my gut is anything at that level of risk, teaming is the most important thing and having a lot of voices in the room um, and not just using a screening tool, but really having a number of people with a lot of eyes in different areas of a student's life and even in the professional world. Um, when we've had those level concerns, we've actually partnered with out of school 
professional people that had specific degrees and experience in those areas and hired them to work with us through those hard times, you know, and also to have a good partnership with the police. In addition, though, and absolutely, but there, there is, I think, within the past couple of months, recent, a, a new tool that um, has been disseminated that really just helps to ask specific questions. So we're all on the same page uh, in terms of asking the right questions, the more specific ones. Thank you. And uh, so as another question, we have a question around um, what steps you might have taken to address the challenges related to staff buy-in and compassion fatigue? So that was more probably my area in terms of buy-in and I'll leave it to Lauren for compassion fatigue. So the, the what we did was we created courses for teachers that were voluntary. So we didn't force them in the room and we, we offered it at different levels. So we did it for middle school and high school and it, we, we called it um, supporting at-risk students and teachers came because they thought, oh, I care about the at-risk students in my, my classrooms. And we just use it as a forum to share stories and have somebody with like Dr. DePinto's expertise to kind of explain you know, what, what was going on and slowly that got the ball going and that get those teachers to, interested to the point where we've now run summer um, programs as part of our professional development, where we offer a, a number of courses in supporting students in these ways. And we have a lot of, I mean, so many teachers signing up that we've had to turn people away and put them to some of the other stuff that we're doing, but it's a slow process. And I would say it took about 10 years where teachers just accept the way we are, we, you know, when I first started, they were like, I just want the assistant principal to wag their finger in the kid's face and get them to stop, where now they're bringing the students saying, I'm concerned about the student. And, and they, we don't have that, like, I just want the kids suspended and out of my room. It's really, the culture's changed and it's, it's starting the ball slowly rolling. Compassion fatigue, Lauren? Yeah, well, I mean, that, I'm trying to think about the best way, right, to capture what I wanna say, because I think first and foremost, compassion fatigue is real. And I think we need to acknowledge it. I think the work we do is really, really tiresome, certainly now more than ever. But I think a way to get around that or what's worked for us and what's worked for me is really about time in, time spent, right? You need to develop trust with people. You need to develop trust with teachers that you say what you mean and you mean what you say, and they know they can rely on you, like any relationship. And that's really, I think, the, the return on that investment has really yielded the results to Basil's point where now it's about trusting the team, right? In, 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 instead of expecting from the team. And when people feel safe in their workplace, when they feel like they have reliable supports that in and of itself reduces um, or serves as a protective factor against buffering against compassion fatigue. But it, you know, I think also incorporating and really making a very clear statement from a district perspective that staff wellness matters and it's an imperative. And we're gonna do things to, to bolster staff wellness. We might not get it right, but I think the first step is the only step that really matters. And it's about having that visible to people so they know that you know, not only do they have supportive relationships from um, colleagues, administrators, but that the district actually is investing in, in different ways that makes their, their workplace stress or compassion fatigue more manageable. Thank you. And again, you know, we see the importance of building relationships and also, you know, the emphasis on the process uh, that these things take time. And I, I appreciate those comments. Um, so I think we have time for maybe just one more question. And this is around um, parents and parent engagement. And how have you managed relationships or situations with parents who refuse or are slow to engage with the school regarding a student's uh, mental health and associated risks? Well, we're gonna end with a very challenging one. Um, I mean, the, the thing about it is that it's very difficult to, to get parents to always do what you think they should be doing. And we also have to be sensitive that, that we're not always in, you know, in their situation, we don't under, fully understand what they're going through. And we have to be mindful of that and not come across as being judgmental or, or anything like that, that pushes them further away from the school. Um, so I will talk from a practical standpoint is that we, we will go through hoops to make it manageable for them to be able to link. So that means, 
you know, if it means having the font, you know, and, and I know that there's people in different situations in terms of their work, but for me personally, you know, if I have to talk to a parent later at night, I will do it. If, you know, if, if I, you know, to, to being open to what their needs are in terms of that link. Um, but if they're not linking, being always mindful of whether or not there's a line being crossed that we need to get, you know, protective services involved, DC, PMP, or if not, you know, if it's not at that, that level, then to really support the students and then tell the, t the parent what we are doing. So I've had parents that didn't want to come in. They did not want to do that. So we tell them we're offering these services and we follow through uh, and just continually communicate with them what we're doing, but support the student, even though the parent's not linking in. Yeah, I would add to that, you know, that is an inherent challenge in our work, right? Um, and that should be expected. And I think for me, again, it is really about understanding or adopting a philosophy of people that helps you understand who they are so you actually know uh, how to work with them right how to see what some of those barriers are and honestly it comes down to trust it, you know if a parent you know or family can trust even if circumstances like i said every district's different um there are a lot of factors and, and things that people are up against and it's incumbent upon us to understand where like the existence the ideology of that resistance to not necessarily um you know, reject the resistance, but to understand it and to figure out adaptive, person-centered ways to meet a person where they are, meet a parent where they are. I mean, you know, we have to have certain assumptions. I'm not into assumptions, but in this case, I am. And we have to assume that parents are trying to do the best that they can. And in, in cases where that might not be the case or cases that homes or families, you know, kids might be exposed to um, risk, it is still a part of our process, our teaming process, to figure out the best, most compassionate ways to, to help a family improve the conditions that they're, that they're in. And a lot of times schools um, can also be a risky place for them. Schools you know, are, are designed to be you know, a healthy place, but sometimes you know, we have to be open to the fact that we have to get or think about ways differently to engage more of a resistant uh, parent or family. And I think that trust, mindset, understanding, and just persistence, not giving up. Don't give up. And you I know, just want to really throw that. just two more things that I thought of is that a lot of times that the, the, the parent might be having some of their own experiences at school come through. And it's like kind of a school fear based on their own circumstances. And to always be mindful not to shame the child of what their parents are doing. Yeah. And again, I think it's really about ongoing dialogue. And I know it seems general, but everything comes down to the team that you're working with, you know, and being able, quite honestly, even though this maybe isn't specifically related to the answer to your question, I don't want to leave this, this program without really making it clear that as subject matter experts, right, it is, it is a part of the teaming process to challenge the team, right? And Basil and I can talk for hours about, about those experiences, but it's important to not just go along with the team. We're there to share ideas. We're there to share different perspectives. And sometimes we need to recognize that maybe the, our course of action isn't necessarily the most helpful or that we're missing a piece and relying on the team to build trust with each other and the families, I, I think is, is really a process that, that's worth investing in. Thank you. Thank you so much for your thoughtful responses. And right now Thank we've you. run out of time for, for questions, but if anyone has any additional questions, feel please feel free to reach out to our center. And I'm going to turn things over to Kati now, who's going to um, discuss the evaluation portion of our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. So um, as a reminder, <clears throat> our center is funded through SAMHSA. And as part of receiving this funding, we're required to submit data related to the quality of this event. So if you do have a, your mobile device handy, you could um, hover over to the QR code that you see on your screen or um, access the uh, evaluation survey by clicking on the link that will be shared in the chat box. I will also email everyone um, the link to the survey in case you do not have a QR code reader at, at the moment. So um, that will be sent in an email. Next slide, please. 
And we're also excited to share with you um, our newest uh, product. It's um, a podcast called uh, Toward Wellness and Recovery. And you can find this um, either on Spotify or Apple Music or by using Podbean. And the focus of this podcast, it's called Flourishing at Work, a helping plan for helping professionals. It's on um, self-care and wellness for all who are in the helping professions. So um, we hope that you also find this enjoyable. Next slide, please. And if you have any other further questions for our center, um, you can contact us at our email. Right now, um, we are still working remotely, so phone isn't the best, but email is where we are the most responsive. You can also follow us in our different social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you are not subscribed to our, e our listserv, email listserv, um, you can do so by um, clicking on the link that was shared in the chat box for our listserv. And again, I'd like to thank our webinar presenters for today, Dr. DePinto and Mr. Basil Pizzuto um, for uh, guiding us through this important topic um, with all of our attendees of for today. We hope that um, you continue to stay safe and well. Um, as a reminder, uh, a webinar recording will be posted on our website as well, because I keep seeing this uh, question in the chat box. So just wanted to make sure everyone um, has that information. Again, we hope that you continue to stay safe and well, and we hope that you can join us at our next webinar um, next month. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much.